Let's stand and go to the word of the Lord with respect to the word of God, if you can, if you're physically able. If you're not physically able, we understand and respect can be given while you're seated. Amen. It's a beautiful Sunday in the house of the Lord. I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for the kind gifts you gave us for Pastor Appreciation Week. You gave us a beautiful card, and in that card was a $500 gift card, and that's allowing me to drive down and see my mom this week, and I appreciate you for that. Thank you. Thank you. That is my gas money to go and see her. I know people think preachers make tons of money, but it's just not the case. And a little blessing like that goes a long ways whenever you want to go see your mom. Of course, she's listening online, so um, it's interesting that everything is online. You know, we had my father-in-law come and preach. How many enjoyed that? Having Pastor and Sister Englehart here, 37 years in ministry. Uh, let's go to the word of the Lord quickly. I want to turn to... Acts chapter 16, verse 26 through 33. And this, of course, is the story of Paul and Silas where we were huddled around last week. Acts chapter 16. I want you to know something, though. I don't know how my Bible got wet, but it did. Oh, <laughs> I did some serious praying over this passage right here. And there's a whole lot of tears. You know, we, when you were in the world, you had tears in your beard. Now we got tears in our Bible. <laughs> Forgive the reference to a country song. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. I'll get back to what I was saying in just a second. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. How many remember this from last week? Good. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly. When God does something, sometimes he does it quick. And there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's, every man's bands were loose. Amen. And there was a freedom that came to the house when men and, that were bound and were beaten decided, no, we're going to praise God. I want to preach just for a little while about being past feeling, but still praising. Amen. Getting beyond your feelings and choosing to praise God anyways, whether you feel like it or not. Talk to you a little while about that and the victory of coming into God's presence. The door in comes through praise and thanksgiving, and the door out of things also is through praise and thanksgiving. It works both ways. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. I ask you to help it to enlighten us and to give us strength. I pray a confidence in the name of Jesus and uh, from your word today that gives us strength to walk with you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know, I felt a little twinge of discomfort when my father-in-law was here and his jacket was kind of folded in and he felt like he needed to adjust because the cameras were on. And I want you to know that if you're watching us online, we're so grateful you can join us. But understand, we don't publish this online. And hear me in here. We don't put this online because we think that we are so good and we are so put together and our, 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 everything's in its right place. We put this online because the gospel has the power to change somebody's life and the word does not return void. And that's the only reason why we have it online. If it ever becomes a greater risk or a greater problem for us. And if we ever think that we need to stand here and look professional and polished and all our words need to be in the exact right place and pastor needs to make sure he uses all the right punctuation in his sentence and everything is so polished, I'll tell you, if we get to that point because those cameras are on, I will turn those cameras off and we'll go back to having Holy Ghost revivals and we'll go back to having tent-like meetings. If we need the move of God, we might even get a tambourine. Well, maybe not that. Maybe not a tambourine. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but I can tell you this. It is not about those cameras. 
we only come to you not because we think we're the greatest. And I used to, when I was younger, I used to have a problem with that because, you know, YouTube became online and people were going, uh, I'm, literally, you can in 30 seconds be in your car and watch a, a, a communicator of the Word of God that is fantastic at systematic use and, you know, exegeting the Word of God. That's a big word. Is it after min? It's almost afternoon. I can't use exegete until afternoon, okay? It's too big of a word for the morning. But... I always felt like, man, I, I, that's that, that makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But then I realized that every city needs to have a prophet. Amen? Every city needs to have someone who gets on their knees and prays their way to the pulpit. Every city needs to have a burden over a man of God. Every city needs to have a burden over a people of God. And if we don't get that burden, we don't have anything to meet for. If we don't understand that we are here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we're here to do something that's beyond our feelings, if we're here not to just talk about the word of God, but to live it, if we don't understand that we're here not to just look good, but to be good under the grace and power of Almighty God. If we don't understand that our praise opens the doors for prisoners that know nothing about Jesus, but when they come online and when they come in this house, they feel the power and the blessing of God. Our preachers better be fighting bees. Our preachers better be on power, on, 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 uh, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. It's a problem when you read your notes and you're preaching at the same time. I'm a one-track-minded preacher. What I was trying to say is the quote from Abraham Lincoln that he wants his preacher to look like he's fighting bees when he's up there. But you have to understand the passion that I preach with is not because I want to present it in a, in a louder fashion. This is not a volume thing. This is a purpose thing, that there is so much need in our world for people to find Jesus. There's so much need for those suicidal to step back out of their darkness into his marvelous light. There's so much need for young people to understand that if you taste and see of the world, it'll only give you destruction. But if you taste and see of the Lord, you'll find satisfaction. There's so much need in in our world for us to say no to the things of this world and yes to the things of God. And so I brought a reminder button for everybody today that every time you say yes to the world, you say no to something in God. And every time you say no to the world, you say yes to something in the Lord. And it's, it's evident throughout everything in life. When you say yes to too busy of a schedule, you say no to your family life. It's not because you have a bad heart. It's not because you're intending to be malicious in any way, shape, or form, or that you're saying yes to anger, and therefore it damages relationships in your home. You're, you're not necessarily intending to use that, but anger doesn't work righteousness, Scripture says. And so we know we have to learn to handle all of these different emotions and put them into Christ Jesus and see how he'd have us handle it. And the one thing we see in this passage of Scripture is they didn't get angry. They didn't get upset. They just said, you know what? I can't control where I am, but I know who controls all things, so I'm going to praise the one who controls all things. Their no to dealing with their own feelings. Their no to putting themselves first. Their no to saying we know who we are and our identity on this earth. They're, they're, I'm a Roman citizen. We talked about last week. Paul could have played the Roman citizen card e early on, and they would have never ended up in the prison. They would have never had their back striped to the point that they need to have them washed when they took the, the prisoner to be baptized. We understand all that, but he said no to all that to get what God could give him. And the jailhouse will only shake if we say no to ourselves and say yes to what God can do. That is the only way prisoners get loosed is if we place ourselves aside. I need you to sit today to take away one thing from this message that you say no to your emotions and say yes to God's truth more than you live on your emotions. You have to hit the no button. This is my last word. No! <laughs> That's my youth pastor coming out. You need to become a professional at... No! <laughs> you have a right by the word of God and by heaven to say... Did you know that? You can say no. 
If it hinders your spiritual walk, N-O. just say no. Uh, this isn't Nancy Pelosi. I'm not oh, Nancy Pelosi. Did I say that name over the pulpit? <laughs> Lord have mercy. The Holy Ghost just left the room. <laughs> this isn't Nancy Reagan. Just say no. God literally said, you can have what your emotions will bring you if you live your life running on your emotions. Or you can have what I've promised you if you live on the promises of God. And it is so hard, I understand that, to push past emotion. But whenever Paul and Silas did that, they set free an entire jailhouse. And I wonder who's waiting on you to live above your emotions and to walk in the truths of the word of God for their freedom. I wonder who's connected to you that could get released, amen, if you would just say no and walk in the presence and the power of God. I wonder. I'm not saying they don't have free will. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that they don't have the possibility of choosing on their own. That is a God-given free will. That is the agency of man. Amen. We have the right to choose. But in this passage of Scripture that we've been around for two weeks now, we see that praise changed everything. And so I'm wondering if maybe you could put on the garments of praise today for the spirit of heaviness. I wonder if maybe you could praise your way into a new place in God. We know that there is something involved in, in this as well, and the emotions often come from places that we can control, we can take charge of. You can't control your circumstances, but you can control how you respond to your circumstances, amen? You can control what you say and do. The only thing that may be, be, le- may be left in this life is the freedom to, do, to control what you say and do. We may not even have the freedom to free thinking anymore. Who knows? At some point, somewhere, sometime, we're going to have to stand up and say, (laughs) as many times as you have to say no, amen? There takes a little bit of of the heart and the mind's decision-making process for you to walk with God. You have to understand that, yes, by his stripes we were healed. Yes, by, by the power of God we are saved. Thank God for the cross. I thank God for him bearing my shame and my sorrow. I thank God for all that. But there is a confidence in Christ Jesus that only comes from a clean conscience, and you have to choose to manage your conscience, amen? You have to choose to manage what you you do and don't do, the right and wrong in your life. And most people begin to come to faith, begin to come to God by the initial evidence of what they notice is right and wrong. That is the first, one of the, almost the first steps where someone begins to turn their heart to God. And that is, they're like, you know what? I don't think that's right. I need to find what's right. I'm looking, and they go on this search and they begin to seek God and their conscience is speaking to them about what is right and what is wrong. And you have to deal with that because 1 John 3, 21 gives us a very powerful, powerful scripture. It says, beloved, in our heart, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And some people walk with God all their life and do not have confidence with God because they have a conscience that is damaged. Amen. And they have not said no to the emotions and the hurts and the pains and the struggles of past life. There are consequences to sin, brothers and sisters. Everybody say sin. The thing about sin is we can choose to sin, but we cannot choose the consequences. Are you hearing me here today? You don't know what is going to happen from those sins. You don't know the ripple effect. You don't know how it's going to affect your children. You don't know what damage is going to come. You do not control the consequences. Therefore, we can't control our choice to sin or not to sin. Amen? We can get empowered by the Holy Spirit, which helps us not to be sinners. In fact, we step into the uh, the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Amen? And by his grace, we are one walking no longer as sinners, but as saved. Thank God we're identified in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we look at Genesis 3 where this all began because how many, do not, how many would say that somebody would want to walk 
with unconfidence. Nobody wants to walk in a place where they feel like they're not confident. All of us want confidence, and even the, even the more when we talk about confidence in Christ Jesus. We want that. And so in Genesis 3, we see, if, if I was to back up and just give you the backstory, here is Adam and Eve, and they're standing in the garden, and this is the initial place where we see conscious come into play, the first place where we see conscious come into play in the scriptures. And, and so we see that in Genesis 3, it talks about the story of this. But if you were to back up just a little bit to Genesis 2, you can read it for yourself when you get home, verses 7 through 9. I don't have this for the media, but it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. I want to say living soul. That's flesh, spirit, and soul and combined. And that came from the Zoe, the life force of God. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man. Amen? Everybody say a place. Amen? Whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord grow, God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, and also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, of course, he told them not to eat it. But there's, there's in those passages of Scripture, if you want to do your homework, Genesis 2, 7, through, you can read down through the rest of the chapter if you, if you want to. But in that passage, it gives you the understanding of a healthy life. A healthy life, number one, has to have a place. You have to have the right perspective of where you are in God and your life. You have to have the understanding of what your purpose is in life. You have to have that perspective. So number one, you have to be placed and know you're placed by God. Amen? So you have to have that perspective. Number two, you have to have identity. You have to have the right identity. And number three, you have to have provision. You have to know that God is providing for you. So perspective, identity in Christ, and provision from God, because he provided for them. Out of the ground grew everything. And so we also find that the fourth thing is we have to have parameters. You have to eat of, you cannot eat of the garden, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can have all of these other beautiful things, but there is one parameter. We as human beings, we need perspective, we need identity, we need provision, and we need parameters to have a healthy life. And you need that for your mind. You need parameters for your mind. You need to be able to take the things that are objective consequences of your sin and put them under the blood of Jesus Christ. And you need to take the things that are subjective consequences of sin that came from your parents, came from the shame or the guilt that was given to you, and you need to say and put them under the blood of Jesus Christ as well. Amen? So not only do you have to deal with the things that came from your choices of sin, but you also have to deal with the things that came from generational curses before you because some people live their entire life trying to please somebody that shamed them or abused them or hurt them, and they don't realize that their life is shaped by all of this guilt and shame, and the, and the people that are in their life, may be in, they may be in relationships that are toxic and not good for them, they need to learn how to say the power of no. Amen? They need to learn how to remove those things from their life and say, you know what? I'm better than this. I'm a child of God. I want to walk in his precepts, and I don't want my conscience to be bothered by somebody who constantly is dominating and overwhelming me with all kinds of guilt and shame and manipulation. Those people you have to distance yourself from because you have the right to have a clear conscience, to walk with God, and to have confidence in Christ Jesus, and you will not gain the confidence you need in Christ Jesus if you have toxic relationships in your life. You need to learn the power of no. I wanted to title this message, The Power of No, but I decided not to because I don't want that to be all the focus. I don't want it just to be about those that have struggled with abuse and have had that laid onto them, and they have subjective guilt and shame. Objective is things you do. Subjective is things others have done that have been laid onto your life. I want you to know you've got to walk out of that stuff. You've got to get out of it. And the only way you're going to get out of that prison is if you praise your way out. The only way you're going to get out of those chains is if you praise your way out. The only way you're going to get out of those bonds and those stocks is if you pray your way out and God will release those prisons of your mind. Because the biggest battle is between your ears. And when you get your conscience set free, 
When you understand that it's your faith in Christ Jesus and is walking through the waters of baptism and it's being filled with the Holy Ghost, which is evidenced by speaking in tongues, which is a sign to the unbeliever, brothers and sisters. And I don't know if you've had the experience or not, but if you've ever been in a place where you doubted your salvation, if you've ever been in a place where you slipped up and you wondered, am I even still a child of God? That book may say that speaking in tongues is for the unbeliever, but what happens if you, the saved folk, have a moment of unbelief? Go ahead and praise God. Go ahead and speak in that heavenly language, and it reminds you that I'm filled with the Spirit of God, that I'm walking with a holy God, that that gift is the answer of a clear conscience toward God. That we understand that salvation's plan starts at faith. We know that. But repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name is what brings us through the blood of the Lamb. And that blood can cover sin. Thank God it can. David recognized it. He recognized it in the Scripture. And he saw it and he said in Psalms 32, 1 and 2, he said, Blessed is the man that knows that God can cover sin. Amen. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. We need to cover it by the blood of the Lamb and water baptism, brothers and sisters. It's the name invoked over somebody's life. I'll come back to that, but I wanted to address Genesis 3 because you know the story. I hope I'm just giving you backstory here, and you already have read. It says in verse one of chapter three of Genesis where we find conscience come into play for the first time. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said. Isn't it funny how the enemy will always use God's words but twist them? Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. It was a question. Didn't he say you could have it all? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. But the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. He didn't say that. That was an addition. He said, don't eat of it. He said, you can't. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said, don't eat of it. But we also know that human beings, when they touch something long enough, they will begin to partake of it. You know what they say, if, you're, if you go to the bar, eventually you're at the bar, then you're at, then you, never mind, I probably shouldn't say that. First you're eating at the bar, then you're at the bar, then you're under the bar is what they say. You have friends at the bar, you begin to drink at the bar, and you begin, begin to become a drunk at the bar. There are things that you have to be careful of as far as the environment and the influences in your life, brothers and sisters. That's all I'm saying, don't be offended. And the, serpents, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God, doth, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, you become the person that determines what's good and what's evil in your own life. You become your own God. I have my own right. I have my own truth. I know what's good for me and what's not good for me. I, have, I know what's right for me. It might not be right for you, but it's right for me. What has happened? You have eaten of the fruit. You have, you have taken on the lie of the enemy and decided that I have become my own God unto myself. And it's very dangerous for you to say, yeah, that's good for you, but it's okay for me especially when the Word of God addresses it and says, do not do these things because they damage your conscience and they damage your walk with God. And when the woman saw that it was, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it to her husband with her. He was right there, just so you know. He could have said something he didn't, and he did eat. And their eyes were open. It goes on to say, it goes on down through the passage. And then we know that, three, that four curses were handed out, that God cursed the man. And then they went to hiding. This is where you find the first time where men didn't run to God. I mean, God would come and meet with them in the cool of the day. You know that, right? He would meet with them in the cool of the day. And they, they, after they had sinned, they realized they were naked. And, and they hid themselves. And they made out of fig you know, out of fig leaves. They tried to make a garment. That was man's idea of how to cover sin. 
But God's idea of how to cover sin was the shedding of blood in animal coats. Amen? So we, we understand that somewhere in, in the course of what happens in the next few chapters of Scripture, someone sheds blood for them so they don't have to die. And then those, those coverings are placed up on man. And that is the same thing that Jesus did for us. He died so that we would not have to die. And his covering was placed on us in baptism. We know that that is where it is invoked and implied in Acts tells us that. But I will get to that in just a minute because I want to make sure you understand that whenever you have something that you're hiding from God, God will come to you and you will feel like you need to run from him because anytime you have something standing between you and God, you cannot bring yourself to come to him face to face. Amen. But if you answer your conscience and if you walk through the plan of salvation that God has given us, you want to run to his face. In fact, the scripture says that you stop seeking his handout and you start falling on your knees and seeking to be before him face to face. You want to be in his presence even more. The closer you get to God, the more you have to deal with your conscience and make it clean. Amen? And then you seek his face the way you want, the way you're supposed to. And so we see the the compartmentalization kicks in, and this is what happens with everybody. Look, we all deal with a conscience. We all deal with stuff that we did wrong. We all made mistakes in life and still make them sometimes, and we can either compartmentalize and say, well, that's just the part of me that I don't want anybody to know about. We hide it. We keep it in the background. We try to cover it with fig leaves. Whatever you do, that is insufficient covering. We know that. But we also know that even while we're compartmentalizing, we want to be looking good over here. We want to be looking right over here. We want to do everything right and have, have no, no place where people see us inadequate, even though we're hiding this compartment. Amen. And, and I know it's that time of year, and I was going to preach a message next week, but I'm going to be with my mom. I was going to preach this message called Skeletons in the Closet since it was going to be Halloween. And I don't honor Halloween at all, but I'm telling you, some people have some skeletons in the closet they need to deal with. Amen. They have compartmentalized their life so that you don't see the shame that they're dealing with and the guilt that they're dealing with. And we're supposed to take those things to the cross because that's where they were handled. And I'll deal with that in just a second. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. But you see that they go into the shame of hiding And we have always hid ourselves from God until we find out that he wants us. He loves us. He loves us even in our sin. He wants to wrap a coat around us when we run home to him and say, this is still my son. He still has my identity. I'm still going to make provision for him, kill the fatted calf. I'm still going to call him mine, put the ring on his finger that says he's my son. I still give him identity. And God changes our perspective from the places that we've been hiding things and says, that can be put under the blood. No, we don't take it lightly. No, we don't abuse grace, but those things are supposed to be put under the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, and you're supposed to stand back up and take a mindset that I'm a child of God, and I have identity in Christ Jesus, and I have a perspective that's changed, and I have provision in the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ, and I have a place in his church, and I want to walk with God and seek his face, and I can do that with a clear conscience, even though I've made mistakes. How many have known that to be true in your walk with God? You have to say no to guilt. You have to say no to shame. and You have to put it under the blood of the Lamb. And if you don't do that, you'll do what they did. You'll start the blame game. Amen? God said, where, where are you? And he said, we were naked. He said, who told you you were naked? How do you even know what nakedness is? How do you even know what shame and guilt is? It's only through sin that those things come into our life. It's only through the sin of others that it's laid onto our life. And we have to learn how to say no to that. We simply have to say no because we will blame other things all of our life to shelter ourselves and hide ourselves. He says, who told you were naked? And they said, what have you done? You know, he said, oh, well, we ate of the tree of the garden. The woman you gave me. It starts the blame game with the woman you gave me. He was standing, that joker was standing right there. I, I do believe he loved her so much that he chose to eat. I do believe that. The Bible does say that she was deceived. He was not. But I think he was deceived by his love for her, that he would rather die with her than die without her. It's a picture of Christ, that he'd rather die to be with us than not. Amen. I believe that. 
That's my personal in belief. But how much, how much would you give if, you, if your loved one was right there and, and they were going to pass away? You know that they ate of the tree and they were going to die and, and you were standing there and you could either live on forever and have them cast out of the garden or you could live with them. I, I think you would choose somewhat the same possibly. But that is what I believe was going on there. And so he said, the woman you gave me, he still blamed her. Amen. And then the woman blamed the snake. Just pass it on down the line. That's what everybody does in this world. Amen. It's not me. It's not anything I did. I, I, I'm clean. I, I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not to be blamed here. So he blames her. She blames the snake. And the snake hasn't got a foot to stand on. It hasn't got a leg to stand on. Is that a bad dad joke that just showed up in my sermon? No dad jokes. So we know that in that situation, God covered their sins. But he did push them out of the garden so they didn't take of the tree of life and forever lived as sinful fallen man. And that was a beautiful thing that God did. We know so many other things. I'm going to skip some notes here because I've spent too long. Isaiah 61 and 3 it says, console those that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. It says that there is a place in God where we can put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. And we also know that God dealt with our shame, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. I want to get you to the point where you understand that this is a toggle switch for the human heart. If you don't live for God, you will get to the point where you're past feeling. You will get a conscience that's seared so much that you'll, do, you'll listen to stuff, you'll watch things, you'll do things, and your conscience will stop speaking to you eventually. The alerts and the bells and the... The no will stop going off in your conscience because you have run over that voice so many times that it no longer has space in your life. You will get to the point like the Ephesians whenever the Scripture talks about that they were past feeling, amen? But you can also live for God to the point where you get past your feelings and you praise him anyways in every circumstance. You can look at situations that you would never think somebody would praise God through. And people can go, I know it's hard. I know life and death comes. I know struggles happen. But regardless of all this, my hand goes up. My praise goes up. My heart reaches out to God because there is no one like him and there is a heavenly hope beating inside my chest and someday I'm going to stand in his presence and everything that left me every loved one that's gone into the grave every person who has walked away but was in Christ Jesus I'm going to see them again I'm going to get to hold them again I'm going to love them again there is something to do with our conscience that helps us when we lay down and put our head on the pillow at night we know that this is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So if you ask me to give all of my life to this earth, I have a no in my life because I have a yes in heaven. And I have places to be, amen? And I've got people to see. Every mother who puts a baby to rest Every mother who has a stillborn, that child goes straight to the presence of God. You're going to see them again. You're going to hold them again. I know you may have two in the earth and have had a miscarriage, but you really have three in your family because there's one waiting on you in heaven. If there was ever a reason to go to heaven, it's because we got loved ones waiting on us there. If there was ever a reason to keep yourself right with the word of God, it's because we have loved ones there. If there was ever a reason to walk with God and to purify yourself in the spirit and remove the, the lusts of the flesh in your life. It's because we've got Jesus there. There's someone who loved us and died for us there and we've got places to be and a Jesus to see. This week was so difficult because I helped bury the niece of my best friend 
And while we were standing around at the back of the coach, the family just gathered together and prayed. And someone said, we'll see her again. We'll see her again. And I just put my arms around him and I laid there. And we just were all in a group and we just began to pray. Why? Because Jesus has bought our eternity with him and our eternity with them. Amen. Because of that, we know we don't need to go looking for blame for why, why it happened. We don't need to go looking for shame because things can come to our life. We feel shameful over. But if we lay it at the cross, we can have a clean conscience. Baptism in spirit and feeling releases you to a clean conscience. This is why people know that he that believeth and baptized shall be saved in the Holy Spirit. It's so important in our life because it is the answer of a clean conscience. Baptism and spirit and filling is what deals with the conscience, brothers and sisters. Repentance is beginning, yes. Faith in God is important, but Acts 2.38, we deal with the fact that we're putting these things, these transgressions under the blood. Then Peter said to them, repent. That is where you extend your faith and say, God, I need you. I need you because I can't get out of this. This is a prison that I'm locked in. And sometimes, I've seen it so many times that people get out of their situation by praising their way out. Amen? They extend their faith and they say, Lord, I'm sorry. And God fills them with the Holy Ghost so beautifully. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For what? For the remission of sins. It's taking that compartment that you're ashamed of that you don't let anybody see and it's putting it under the blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. And it releases your conscience, releases that nagging voice that says, but you know who you are. Whenever the enemy comes to condemn you for that, just tell him no. When he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. You heard that one, right? It's for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And 1 Peter 3 and 21 anchors this all together. The like figure unto even baptism also doth now save us. It's a saving work, brothers and sisters. It's saving your mind from a consciousness that accuses you. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. He said, you're not taking a bath when you get into the baptistry. You're not cleaning up, spraying Axe Spray, going off to work. No, dear Lord. Did Axe Spray just get in my sermon? We're going to have to do some editing, Brother Nate. <laughs> it is not a bath. It's not cleaning up your flesh. It's cleaning up your spirit, and it's releasing your conscience. Amen? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Baptism gives you confidence because every time you slip up, you go, I was buried in the name. I was buried. No, devil, I know I mess up sometimes. And no, I don't do grotesque sins. I'm not talking about conscientious people that do premeditated sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you mess up, you go, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up, but I've got a baptism that remitted all sin, and it did everything for my past as it's going to do for my future future, that one baptism is good enough for me to bury everything back in it. And when I throw it at the baptism of Jesus the Christ in my life, when I throw it at the baptismal tank, it gets buried under the blood again. And I walk away with a clean conscience. So whenever the devil comes and condemns me, says, you know who you are, you know what you do. I said, no, no, I, I, I am not identified by what I do. I'm identified by who he says I am in him. You cannot make my conscience condemn me, devil, because I've been buried in the name. That's what baptism is for. It's the answer of a clear conscience toward God. By the resurrection, wait a minute, uh-oh, he's applying resurrection as well. We just got through baptism that doth now save us because it helps our conscience, and now he's going to stick in, in feeling of the Holy Ghost on top of it? 
Oh, thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for identifying for us what Acts 2.38 means. It's not only the faith in Christ Jesus, but it's the burial in the name of Jesus, and it's the infilling of the Holy Ghost that gives us confidence in the name of the Lord for us to walk in power and might and not be sinners but be saved individuals. Amen, somebody. Somebody give them a praise in this house. Gets us past our feelings and into praising him. Let's stand together. If you can stand. I understand we have folks that have reasons that they can't stand in their body. God can move even in the worst situations, even when the greatest mess. I've had people come to the altar that were murderers. And you think, what? What is God going to do with this? Did you know a lot of the Bible is written by murderers? Did you know that? Moses murdered somebody. Paul sent people off to be killed. Just so you know, there are people in here that had to say no to their conscience. (laughs) They had to say no to their conscience that tried to tell them, you don't deserve to be where you are. None of us deserve the hand of grace on our life. It is by God that we are drawn anyways. So thank God that we can live past feeling, amen? And we can praise him. We can praise him. Worship team's coming to help me. I think they're going to help me. Would you lift your hands and just praise God? Thank you, Lord that the baptism, like figure of baptism, doth now save us. The the thing that saves us is being buried with Christ in repentance, in baptism. Repenting and dying to ourselves in repentance. Being buried in baptism, which helps our conscience and being filled with the Holy Ghost or coming out in resurrection. Amen. These are the things that help us in our conscience. Somebody needs to get a power of no in their life. They need to walk away from some things that have been keeping them subjectively in shame. I'm going to open this altar, and I want you to come down here. If you have a toxic relationship in your life, if you have something you're struggling with, if you have something that's putting any shame or any guilt in your life, you are not meant to live in that place. Come on, we're going to have a shaking take place, and there's going to be some freedom in this house. I believe in the name of Jesus right now that you're going to release somebody from an addictive mother. You're going to release somebody from a a controlling and angry father. You're going to release somebody from abuse in the name of Jesus. I believe it. I believe it right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I believe it. Come on, lift your hands and say no to that conscience. Say no to that that guilt. Say no to that shame. It's covered by the blood of Jesus. If you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, we can cover that guilt and shame today. We can release you. We can release you to freedom. We can release you to a praise that is free from your feelings, that you can get past your feelings and and still be praising him. Amen, amen, amen. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Come on, if you know he can release you, put a praise on your lips. Put a praise in your hands. Let's praise him together. You were holy. You are righteous. You are glorious. You are mighty. You are mighty. There is no Come on, don't let your conscience bother you anymore. You're going to get better sleep tonight. You're going to get a healthier body. You're going to get a healthier mind. If you just praise him. If you just praise him and say it's under the blood. I've been baptized in the name of Jesus. You cannot hold me to those things, devil. God has released me by the power of his baptism and by the power of the Holy Ghost. We release somebody today. We release somebody today to get past their feelings and to praise you anyways. Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. I'm past it. It's gone. I'm over it. I'm over it. Because God got over it for me. He's covered it. You were holy. Thank you, Lord. You were Thank righteous. You were magnificent. You were victorious. You were mighty. You were omnipotent. I feel like there praising him. I feel like praising him. You were holy. Oh, he said.
set me free. He set me free. Not just from my sin, but from my conscience, which bound me. I feel freedom. Somebody bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Somebody bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name.